unbelievable ones. And I've heard a lot of pleas, this study and that study. My qualifications are, I'll go through a couple of years briefly, 1952, responsible for the manuals and the instructions for the handling of the atomic pile in the Nautilus submarine. 1958, responsible for all of the instruction on operation and maintenance for the Thor ICBM missile. Going on into 1962 and three, I prepared four federal military specifications on thermonuclear weapon system equipment tests. Gentlemen, ladies, I do know science. All that I've heard have been studies. In fact, that's what every one of you has read and based something on. I learned in my first year of high school science, and I dearly hope it's still being taught, a study is step one of five. A study is the basis for a theorem. You develop your theorem, you create an axiom, the formula by which you prove your theorem. You apply your axiom, then your analysis and results are step five. Now relying on studies for scientific information is much the same as if your child, your child, your child were sent to the first grade, then to the second grade, and then you say, oh, let's stop this education. Go on out and workplace. You've only done the study, part one. You wouldn't send your children out after two grades. Don't make a decision on anything unless it has gone through all five steps. Now the next thing we go about this North Carolina judge and Center for D Disease Control report that he had said was very flawed. The report was a compilation of 43 papers by scientists and 37 of those scientists threatened suit because the papers were entirely out of context. What they did is take a sentence here and a sentence there. It would be like if I saw some magazines and newspapers, here is one sentence. The Missoula Health Department members are meeting at yada yada yada. And then I took another thing Zoological Society declares that baboons are a society of organized idiots. Well, if I put those two together, the Missoula Health Department members are organized idiots, that wouldn't be true. That is the reason that the Center for Disease Control report is totally false. It's like looking out at the dark, dark sky and saying, well, it must be daylight. It was daylight out there when I came in. One final thing. One test has been taken through all five steps. This was done by a research facility in Connecticut approximately three years ago. It was reported in newspapers, albeit hidden inside in a couple column inches. What they did was make a study, then a theory, then they set about their proof in laboratory circumstances. They wanted to gauge the amount of nicotine, its enzyme breakdown, everything that had to do with extraneous smoke, which you all now call environmental smoke. Environmental, the word is a neat trick phrase, but extraneous smoke, and do you know what they found out? I won't ask you to guess, because I don't think any one of you read that thing and remember it. All root and leaf vegetables give the same amount in the same in 
enzymal circumstance in the body as extraneous smoke. In fact, two and a half ounce serving of potatoes, I think it was a three and a quarter ounce serving of Brussels sprouts, and they went all through the leaf and root vegetables, had identical concentrations of nicotine in the identical form found by secondhand smoke, as if you had been in a room where nine cigarettes had been smoked. Now, in all good conscience, since you are a health department and you are interested in the, quote, help of the community, I will walk away cheerfully assuming that if you choose to ban the extraneous smoke of nicotine and tobacco, you are also going to ban the ingestion of all leaf and root vegetables. Thank you for your time. My name is Richard Goldsmith. I run a restaurant in Missoula, and I've been doing that for over 14 years. I'm a non-smoker, and from the day I opened my restaurant, it has been a non-smoking facility completely. I made this choice as a personal choice, and I've had customers who've said, I'll, I won't go there because you don't allow smoking, and I've said, that's fine. There's other places you can go. Uh, with this proposed ordinance, you intend to take away people's right to choose what they want to do, and you're also overlooking the fact that many business people have made the conscious decision to already ban smoking in their establishments as a response to what their customers want. So if customers overwhelmingly tell me they don't want smoking, I have responded and I don't allow smoking in my establishment. The one problem with this whole thing that I don't think has ever been brought up here is what about the employees? As Tim France mentioned, probably 50% of my employees also smoke. Am I allowed at the employment interview to ask this potential employee, are you a smoker? And if they answer yes, do I say, I'm sorry, I can't hire you because we not only do not have a place in our building for you to smoke, this new ordinance now makes you go how many feet away from my property? I, is it 25 feet, 50 feet? Is there, is there some distance an employee must move from the building to smoke? No. So they can still sneak to the back door and smoke, okay. But, uh, I, you know, if you're going to ban smoking, hey, let me hire all non-smokers. But I don't have that right because that's discrimination. And I wish that could be addressed as well because it makes it real hard on business people when some customers want to smoke and a lot of employees want to smoke and there's really nothing that we can do about that. I hope you don't pass this ordinance. Thank you. Um, my name is Ani Swojahowitz, and um, the first thing I wanted to do is draw your attention to um, a report put together by the American Lung Association um, on the enforcement of secondhand smoke um, ordinances. It's already in your packets, but there were a few places I wanted to draw your attention to because it has been mentioned as a concern. Um, the first is about um, a town in Oregon, Corvallis, Oregon, um, and I'll read directly from the report. Corvallis, Oregon is a college town with a population of 52,000. Their secondhand smoke ordinance is one um, Chief Raskowski was initially very concerned about, but it has not been difficult at all. Basically, the ordinance is self-enforcing. The ordinance includes sales to minors and retailers licensing besides the secondhand smoke protections. The police department was instrumental in development of um, the ordinance, so um, put in time up front, but it has not been time consuming since passage. The health department screens complaints first and education has been a major focus. Um, another quote from Chief, or about Chief Sarvello in Marquette, Michigan. Um, since he has been police chief three and a half years, not one citation has been issued. They have high compliance in Marquette and he believes this is why the enforcement is simple. He knows that in 1987 the police had concerns about enforcing this ordinance, but it has been very 
has had very little resistance. They happen to get a complaint, they forward it to the health department, and the health department sends out a letter. Um, lastly, from uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, um, to remove ashtrays and put up signs is all that is needed from the owners of restaurants. Besides your education, very unlikely the owners will have to do more than inform their customers if someone is smoking. Las Cruces ordinance was passed three years ago. It is one of the least problematic on the books. Um, the list goes on and on, and each one of these um, police chiefs has volunteered their phone numbers to be called if you care to call them and ask them for any further questions because um, although they were also skeptical in the beginning about the enforcement aspect, um, things are going fine. And um, the second thing that I wanted to do is um, present um, to you the City County Health Board of Missoula um, 4,508 signatures in support of the ordinance. Um, these signatures were gathered by a group of volunteers, um, sort of loosely known as Smoke Free Missoula. Um, included among these 4,508 signatures are 187 from out of state. Um, we decided to include these signatures um, in response to the argument that tourists will no longer be attracted to Missoula if the restaurants within it are smoke free. Um, I assure you we could have gotten probably 10 times that many um, from out of staters if we'd so chosen. Um, it's my opinion as someone who spent a large amount of time collecting signatures and who worked with many of the volunteers who also collected them that um, this really represents a significant portion of the people in this county and um, speaks to the desire of the citizens who live here. My name is Marian Hurdikin, and I just wanted to come and briefly express my support for this ordinance. I think it's really important that we have places that people can that people can go into public places and not be exposed to the health, the negative health effects of secondhand smoke. Um, I'm particularly concerned about this because we all know that we have a major outdoor air pollution problem in Missoula already, and as a result of that. Um, well, I, since living here, have developed some respiratory problems myself, which I don't know are in response to that, but I have a feeling that um, being exposed to air pollution on a consistent basis that's ab above levels that are considered um, healthful by the EPA has damaged my lungs to some extent. And um, I really feel that it's important uh, for people who are sensitive to smoke to be able to have places that they can go um, that are smoke free. And I'm also really concerned about uh, our children. And one of the things that I think about when I think about the possibility of having children in this community is, you know, how is their lung function going to be as they grow up here? And I think that this ordinance is one step in the right direction to um, providing a healthy and safe environment for our children. Thanks. My name is Dave Havlick. I'm a citizen here in Missoula, and I'm here uh, on behalf primarily uh, of my lungs. Um, I, I tend to breathe the air here in town, and as Marion just mentioned, th the air outside, we don't have to look very far back in the, in the past to, to see stage one air alerts from the wildfires this year. We don't have to look very far into the future probably. Uh, usually in, in November, we start getting into to poor marginal and, and stage one air alert quality air. Um, so it, it seems in, in that context, as the months shrink when we have clean air outside, that it becomes increasingly important to protect the air indoors. Um, what I'd really like to do probably is, is ask you all to ban cars in, in Missoula, but since that seems like a, a radical proposal and something that probably wouldn't be well received, <laughs> it, it seems like a modest step to say, why don't we protect our indoor air quality and not let people smoke in public places? I, th I don't think that's a, an extreme measure to, to, to ask for. Um, I am sympathetic to the concerns of business owners. I don't think we have to look very far to find examples of communities that have, have passed ordinances similar to this. All their businesses haven't gone belly up. We don't even have to look beyond the confines of this town 
to see places like the Old Post on Wednesday night or the Iron Horse on Thursday night that do quite well with smoke-free nights. Um, it's nice to keep it at a voluntary level, but I think it's, it's important for people who can't, for children who, who are brought to places by their parents, for people who don't know what they're getting into, who want to go out and have a beer, um, who, who don't know what nights of the week are smoke-free, whatever, who don't want to limit their activities to Wednesday or Thursday, that um, we, we protect public places from smoking. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. My name is Pamela Kirolf. I am a member of the uh, Smoke Free uh, Citizens Committee and a former uh, executive director of the American Lung Association in Idaho. Um, by now, you should all be aware of the dangers of secondhand smoke, although some people in the audience seem a little hazy on that subject. All of us have been exposed to secondhand smoke to differing degrees. Some of us are more sensitive to it than others. In fact, one-sixth of the U.S. population suffers from some chronic health condition which makes them more sensitive, and our children with their developing lungs are more sensitive too. So how much exposure does it take before we are hit with cancer, asthma, heart disease, autoimmune disorders, respiratory distress, chronic bronchitis, and other devastating health effects? We don't know. What we do know is that secondhand smoke effects can be deadly. Well, some people may be saying, but I've been exposed to secondhand smoke all my life and I'm not sick yet. Or maybe by grace, they never will be. But Dan Fox is. Dan and his wife, Laura, are recent friends of mine. We were brought together because of our deep concerns about the dangers of secondhand smoke and because we both share a diagnosis of cancer. Dan Fox has lung cancer, small cell carcinoma, which is only attributable to tobacco smoke. But he never smoked. He hiked, rode bicycles, and climbed mountains instead. His father smoked at a time when Big Tobacco started manipulating the ingredients, adding such carcinogens as ammonia to create greater addiction. But his father, like my father, didn't know that. And he was unaware of the dangerous effects of his smoking on his kids and others. And also for seven years, Dan worked as a social worker in the city county health building. The offices were open with little cubicles and they all shared the same breathing space. There were a lot of smokers. The workers and administrators knew about the dangers of smoking, but they didn't know how dangerous secondhand smoke was. Some didn't like it and did feel adverse effects. But we know it now, but not in time to help Dan. His lung cancer, in spite of his valiant and courageous efforts, <coughs> and those of his doctors and family, has metastasized to his brain, affecting his motor coordination and threatening his life. The doctors are not optimistic. Dan had brain surgery this past week to try and relieve some of the pressure, but he's really disappointed because he thought surely he'd be able to join his friends this weekend and climb a mountain even though he's been climbing the biggest mountain of them all. And Dan has asked me to tell his story tonight one more time, because you will know that a real person, not just a statistic, is suffering due to secondhand smoke, and his family is suffering, and his friends. And maybe his story will get through to you and the general public that secondhand smoke is a maimer and a killer. And then there is Laura Swanson, who recently worked for four years in an office in Missoula where she was exposed to secondhand smoke. She developed adult onset asthma, which her pulmonologist attributes to her exposure to secondhand smoke. And asthma is a really debilitating health condition to have because you can't breathe very well. 
And when you have acute episodes, you can barely breathe, and sometimes not at all. This happens to kids, too, when they're exposed to secondhand smoke and have asthma, and it brings on acute episodes. Well, so what's that really like? Well, hold your nose, stick one of those red plastic coffee stirrers in your mouth, and try to breathe through it. That's what it's like. You won't be able to do it for very long before the reflex to breathe more takes over and you open your mouth and you unplug your nose. But for people with asthma, it's not that simple. So you see, banning smoking in public places and businesses is not about personal freedom and choice and unnecessary regulation of business. It's about health. And in our society, no one has the right to hurt another person, such as Dan, or Laura, or me, or you. It is the government's responsibility to protect public health. We just don't self-regulate very well, which is why we have public health officials and boards made up of citizens to help us, inform us, and protect us. Please support the secondhand smoke ordinance and include workplaces in the ordinance. Please follow what you are mandated to do, which is protecting public health. Thank you. My name is John Suprock. I'm not a public speaker and I don't have a prepared statement, but I made a few notes while I was listening to others, so please bear with me. I'm not a smoker. I am allergic to tobacco. I'm also an asthmatic and I take medication daily and I carry an inhaler with me on the chance that I have a serious episode. I wouldn't consider myself a fanatic about smoking, but I have tried to get friends to quit, relatives, etc. I think most of us believe that smoking is not good for you and I'm in that camp. I don't see any benefit to smoking. Should at some point I find out that my children have decided to take up smoking, there would be a problem at my house. <laughs> um, but my bottom line on this ordinance is I would never support it because this is about choice. I can choose what restaurants and what bars and what taverns I want to go to, and I do. There are places that I go into that are too smoky and I leave. I have been in the hospital many times myself with uh, lung problems. I've had my sinuses and nasal passages operated on, et cetera. But I still think you're fiddling with our rights and I don't think you should go there. I also would add, there were many stories tonight of people who have been affected children, unborn babies, etc. None of these people's problems as they were presented would be changed by the way this ordinance is currently written. The only way to do that would be to ban smoking from the United States. The United States government has been negotiating with tobacco companies for several years now. Not once has it been proposed to ban smoking or to ban tobacco, which is currently a legal item in these United States. Other people have also stated, umpteen other cities have passed this ordinance. My father used to say to me, if Jimmy jumped off a bridge, would you? I have not jumped off that bridge. One other thing that very much bothers me as a person is the fact that this ordinance would require the business owners to become unpaid policemen for the city. This is not right. It just isn't right, especially if it's against their will. If you want to have the ordinance and you want to enforce it, it should be yours. 
lastly I would say there's a big movement in government today to promote tolerance to not discriminate against people and I think both sides here feel they're being discriminated against or maybe more than two sides because there's the smokers, the non-smokers, the businessmen, the health organization, etc. Obviously, as I stated before, I don't think smoking is a good thing, but I think taking the approach of removing our freedoms is not a good thing either. Thank you for your time. These things are for little people. <laughs> uh, my name is Larry Lambert. I represent Ruby's Inn and Convention Center, the Hampton Inn, and the Montana Innkeepers Association. I was not able to get my name on, on the sign-up ro roster. I looked for it. I got here a little bit late, so I apologize for that. Um, but I, I would first like to say that, that I, I really do sympathize with a lot of the, the people in this room who, who have gotten up and they've spoken and, and, and there's some terrible, terrible stories about family members and, and or friends or themselves and I myself can, can tell you about my father. My father, he smoked all of his life. I never know my father to not smoke. He passed away a young man. But when I think about that, I've never once, never once in my life have I blamed the makers of those cigarettes for what my father did to himself. My father did that because he wanted to. He loved it. He loved his smokes, as he called it. It's a decision that he made. It wasn't the, the manufacturers of those cigarettes that killed him. He did it to himself. But. I would, I'm very much opposed to this ordinance, and I've just got a few reasons why, why I am. First of all, the, the, the businesses in, in Missoula, I feel, are doing a very good job to, to police themselves. And I can tell you at the two properties, the two motels that I, that I manage, we do not allow, allow any of our employees to smoke in any of the buildings. It's been probably three years now since we've allowed any of our employees to smoke in any of the buildings. In the winter, it's awfully cold out there. <laughs> and and we, our employees have to smoke outside. It is cold. But it's a decision that they make. If they want to smoke, they'll smoke outside because we do not <coughs> want to subject our other employees to the smoke. And we have a smoking area in our restaurant. That's the only place that, that we allow smoking in any of our buildings. We don't allow it in the convention rooms. We don't allow it in any of the, the hallways or foyers. We don't allow it in the lobbies. We have one smoking section in the restaurant and it's not going to be long before that's not smoking also. Because as the public demands it and as our guests request it, we will make more of the property non-smoking. The latest thing is is the restaurant will probably be non-smoking. The entire building, all of the buildings will be non-smoking. <coughs> Each person has the, has the right to enforce this ban without the ban because I'm, I myself, I don't go in bars. I think I've been in a bar, I can count it on one hand. I've been in Missoula for seven years and I bet I've not been in a bar five times in Missoula. I don't smoke. I don't like smoke. I don't want to be around it. I don't want my family to be around it. I don't do it. And I have people come into the motel every night, and I'll have non I'll have smoking rooms left. And it always seems that the smoking rooms are the last rooms to go. And I have to ask people, would you like that this is all that I have is a smokable room? Would you like to take a look at it? Most people won't take it. We're doing a big remodel at the motel at, at the beginning of next month we're making more non-smoking rooms. I've, I've talked to a lot of different hotel and motel operators in, in the city of Missoula. Most truly will not be affected by this ordinance. And the last thing I would like to say is that 
if public health is the true concern of this ordinance, I would suggest that you ban smoking in houses where people smoke and they subject their children to smoking and in vehicles. Thank you very much. Back, back, to, back to the small people again. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chuck Wood. I'm the deputy director for the American Cancer Society in northwestern Montana. Although I do live in Big Fork, I need to state up front, I'm uh, the acting director for Missoula and western Montana, filling in for Carolyn McVicker, uh, who resides here in Missoula and who has served on the task force that's helped to draft some of the provisions for this uh, bill, or for this proposed ordinance. Uh, I'll be brief, it's late in the evening. I just want to make a few comments. Uh, this is a public health issue. Um, there's been a long-standing body of hard scientific evidence out there to show that it is a public health issue. Much has been done since uh, the 1950s and 1960s when the Surgeon General first came out in 1964 to, to show a direct causal relationship between those who smoke cigarettes and those who developed lung cancer. And uh, we will admit uh, that there has been progress made in an awful lot of businesses and uh, not allowing smoking. However, it's still a health issue. And uh, I like to use the analogy of, well, do you wait until people finally get there or how many people you have to kill at the stop sign before you finally, or kill at the corner before you finally put up a stop sign? We're losing about 160,000 people per year to lung cancer, which is directly attributable to smoking. And as has been testified time and time tonight, about 3,000 of those cases are directly related to side stream smoke. And about 56,000, you know those numbers for other causes of cancer. As early as 1986, the Surgeon General issued another report on involuntary smoking in which he stated, and I quote, involuntary smoking clearly documents that non-smokers are placed at increased risk for developing disease as a result of exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, end of quote. The general went on to say, and again a quote, critics often express that more research is required that certain studies are flawed or that we should delay action until more conclusive proof is produced. As a physician and as a public health official, it is my judgment that the time for delay is past. Measures to protect the public health are required now. This, the scientific case against involuntary smoking as a health risk is more than sufficient to um, just, justly appropriate remedial action. And the goal of any remedial action must be to protect the non-smoker from environmental uh, smoke. End of quote, and that was back in 1986. So we're still fighting with this issue. We're waiting for all these voluntary mandates to be put into place and, uh, so that there's no smoking in any public body, and it continues. Um, I really, I'm going to end my comments there because it's late, and I do thank you for this forum and uh, for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. Thank you. Hello, thanks for allowing uh, us to take this time to talk to you about this important issue. My name is Linda Lee and I work with the American Lung Association and I just want to repeat something to you because I really want you to remember it. Secondhand smoke is the third leading cause of preventable death in this country. The third leading cause, more than car accidents more than AIDS, and these issues get a lot more attention, but this particular problem causes a lot more death, secondhand smoke, and you have an opportunity to help alleviate that problem, and I'm really hoping that you, you have the courage to do that. The three main arguments against doing something like this are economics, enforcement, and choice. Let the business owner choose and let the person choose. Well, you have in your packets something on enforcement. We have been told over and over and over again, talking with real people in real cities in the United States that say enforcement is not a problem. You have in your packet a study on economics. These are scientific studies. 
based on tax revenues in these cities, in cities next to the cities that don't have ordinances, com making comparisons. Um, every day there is more information. Ellen Leahy cited the North Carolina study that just came out recently. This is working in other places, and it can work in Missoula, Montana. Just recently, we, we, don't, we don't usually find this, but in the nightclub and bar magazine, in the August issue, under industry news, they make a reference to a town in Illinois that's trying to pass a secondhand smoke ordinance. And they're talking about the opposition that's, that, it, that usually happens from restaurant owners and tavern owners. But they also say that since January 1st, it's been illegal to smoke in any California restaurant or, bo or bar. While many in the in industry are still attempting to have the ban repealed, uh, other owners and operators have adapted to the change. Despite predictions to the contrary, California's food and beverage industry continues to thrive, prompting many local and state officials nationwide to wonder if they too could get away with an across-the-board ban. Um, I'm, I'll give you a copy of this, but what I'm trying to say is this is evolving, and there's more information all the time, and we're finally seeing, even in restaurant and bar industry magazines, that it's working in places. And I just encourage you to look at the economics from a different perspective also. Look at the economics of what it costs a business owner to have to allow smoking. Smoking in workplace damages property and increases cleaning costs. A survey of 2,000 smoke-free workplaces found that 60% reported a reduction in maintenance and cleaning costs. Secondhand smoke harms the health and reduces productivity of the non-smoker. That makes sense. It is a, it is, there are costs that we're not looking at that I think we need to consider. I just hope that you realize that you're doing the right thing. You're considering the right thing. And I also hope that you look long and hard at the workplace issue. As, you know, I, I, I would like to just get out of my role as a representative of the Lung Association, talk about my personal experience. I related to these kids talking about their parents smoking. I grew up with two smoking parents. Well, that raises my chances of developing lung cancer by 16%. I also waited tables in smoking restaurants for many years. It raises my chances probably up to about 36% of developing lung cancer. I live in a city with pretty bad air pollution, so it probably goes up a couple more notches. Now, I don't go around, you know, with fear in my body about developing lung cancer, but it's a concern, and it should be a concern for all of you and anyone who spends any time around secondhand smoke. It doesn't take much to, tri to trigger cancer. So I encourage you to look at workplace again, look at the ability for the health department and the health board and the city to pass something that includes restrictions on workplace smoking. There are many people out there who are developing problems because they work in the workplace and they don't have the choice to go find another job. Jobs are not that easy to find. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name's uh, Steve Nelson. I'm a <coughs> bar and restaurant operator in Missoula. Been here for about 18 years. I just have a few quick comments. I'll try to make this as fast as I can. Uh, one of the things that uh, maybe somebody can help me with uh, that I didn't quite understand, there's a, I, th I thought somebody said that the ventilation equipment that they provide for restaurants and bars is not effective, yet it's part of the ordinance. Somebody help me with that. Is that, can they be effective, I guess is what I'm saying, or can they not be? And if they can't, why is it in the ordinance? Um, they're not totally effective, and what is in the ordinance does not require a retrofit uh, to improve ventilation. What it requires is in new construction to have completely separate ventilation in areas that allow smoking from areas that don't. And that's the only way the ventilation can truly be effective is if it's completely separate ventilation. But it can be if you ventilated a separate room that was a smoking room and you ventilated that separately, it can be effective. It can take the carcinogens out of the air. 
No, not not all the carcinogens out of the air, but it would be more effective to have it separated okay. than to just increase. Okay, I, okay. I guess my, my point would be, why spend all this money if it's not effective? I mean, why stick a regulation on us? I mean, I think anything we do, I would like to see, you know, uh, I think that's a good ordinance, but if it doesn't do any good, don't, don't charge us a bunch of money for it. Uh, I think it's interesting that the uh, health board is encouraging, it seems to me, that uh, we want to have more gambling machines in our casinos. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Ellen Inkstead from uh, Don't Gamble with the Future will freak out when she sees that. A uh, couple other things, just comments that I have. Uh, I know that this will hurt some businesses, especially small businesses. It's not going to hurt big, big, big businesses, and this is not going to affect me. I have an all-beverage license that won't affect me whatsoever. But it will hurt small businesses, people that have uh, less than 11 machines. Uh, that have little taverns that do sell food that have to do all those things to make it work. It it'll affect those people, and it'll cost some jobs and it'll cost some businesses. Um, jumping around a little bit, I wish we could spend all this time going over to Sentinel High School or Hellgate High School, and uh, Loyola, and stopping all these kids that are underage that we already know uh, it's illegal to do that. But everybody stands around and watches it, and it bugs the hell out of me. If I caught my kid out there, somebody said earlier, there'd be big problems in my house. Why don't we do something about that? We do all these, make all these rules, let's do something about it. Um, nobody is dragging customers into our places or employees or anything like that. They come of their own free will, they come because they like what you offer. If you have smoke, they're not gonna come. Uh, if they don't like it, they'll go someplace that uh, offers a, a no smoke atmosphere. So. You know, I'm against this uh, ordinance in its present form. Uh, just one other little thing. When I came here in 1980, we talked about uh, there was a lot of problems with wood smoke, and I had a wood stove in my house. But you folks gradually, carefully, you didn't ban anything. You didn't put anybody out of business. You didn't put any wood stove makers out of business. You gave them an opportunity through technology and time to figure out a way to create uh, another way to utilize wood or not utilize wood, whatever they wanted to do, but they didn't just come out and ban everything. And today, we don't have as big a problem. I think you would all agree with that. And uh, I think it's marvelous the way you handled that. I think it's wonderful. And I don't have a wood stove anymore. You made it so that eventually, I just didn't want to have one. It didn't make any sense to have one. And I think there's probably a way to do that in this ordinance. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jim Fragnito. I own the 10th Street Tavern. And I mainly just want to point out that I think with your ban on, on smoking with places that have less than 11 machines or beer and wine license, it will affect me directly. I don't see any difference between an all beverage license and a beer and wine license as far as this, this goes. I want you to think about that. It will shut me down immediately. Either that or it will force me to in, to bring in more gambling. Thank you. My name is Lyle Onsager. I wasn't going to speak initially. Um, part of it, I guess, was fear of being up here. But I was in the military for 22 and a half years, and currently, you cannot smoke in uniform unless you are in your vehicle or in your private house, okay? I know before I got out of the military, they were already drafting regulations to ban coffee drinking, but they didn't know how the heck they were gonna enforce it. <laughs> so, the only thing I can say is, just more regulations does not really solve the problem. Education is your biggest problem. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dave Campbell, uh, owner of Crossroads Truck Center out at the Y. I'm within your five-mile abatement uh, line. I think this is very unfair. I would like to speak to you a little bit about economics and I know that uh, that's probably a dirty word but I've got to survive 
I, I fail to understand why that you have a five mile limit when a guy down the road from me, maybe a mile or two mile, is out of this and he can then go ahead and absorb my customers that I'm going to lose because I cannot accommodate that customer. Economics is one thing that I do understand. I, there's some things that were talked about tonight that I don't, but I do understand economics. And please do not pass this ordinance as you've got it written. Thank you. I am Sandy Sickles. Uh, my secretary faxed a letter to the health department today, and I'm wondering if you folks got it. You did get it, Ellen? Yes. Okay. Um, did everybody get a copy of that? How did that work? It's in the pile it's that was left on your desk tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just uh, was certain that my other meeting wasn't going to be done in time to be here, but I'm here. So I'm here double, okay? I think this is silly regulation over-regulation and it's not necessary and I don't want to be the policeman and I don't think it's fair for you to ask me to ask my secretary to be a policeman. My car is a public vehicle. The rental car that I rented last weekend is a public vehicle and my office which is a one person plus one staff person is a public place and would fall under this regulation. And I don't think that's right, and I don't really think that's what you intended, and I think you really need to readdress all of that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to make any comments? Okay, well then, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, we will, uh, since we're not going to be acting on this tonight, I'm sure, um, there's a lot of uh, for all of us to consider and digest, and I'm sure there may be further uh, thinking and, and uh, looking at the terms in the regulation. I know there's been some suggestions made that we might want to consider before we even consider adopting any regulation. I appreciate the time, and I pr particularly appreciate everyone sitting here. We've been here almost three hours, and I appreciate the attention. Um, as you can see, I think all of us have... Uh, wanted to uh, hear from everyone and uh, that's why I think the board, I, the sense I got the board was pretty attentive to all of this and we appreciate the comments. Uh, we will close the public hearing then and uh, I guess officially we will allow some additional t time for people to put, provide written comments but basically the public hearing is closed. Thank you very much. Is there any other comments or statements from any members of the board? Thank you all for your efforts. Good thoughts. Just a minute. Sure, Andy, let me. Yes, I just one thing I'd like to say to the folks uh, in the audience um, or te people that are testifying. Um, throughout the process, we've asked uh, participants in the meetings to make proposals uh, in regards to the draft ordinance. I, I think that it's a pretty certain thing that there's going to be an ordinance. Um, I'm, I'm committed to that personally. Uh, but I, I really believe that uh, there's some redlining uh, that could be done and some modifications and proposals by those of you out in the community. And uh, uh, frankly, I'd like to see more input uh, on, on the ordinance that we have here. I'm sure it's going to be redrafted, so please uh, make suggestions. Yeah, in particular, I know that there were people that said that they had additional suggestions or things that they thought could be, I think uh, Jeff Hainline said, less draconian if there are suggestions that are concrete from other places or other locations that people think would be more uh, acceptable or if they're on the other side, there are particular issues that uh, uh, the proponents want stronger enforcement on particular issues. All of us would like to, we want to have as much input into this process as possible. So, go ahead. Uh, just a, a question. Is the board considering holding off then on debate and discussion and possible action until your October meeting, or are you interested in something before that? Uh, as a matter of um, order here, I generally don't, the staff doesn't redraft 
at this point without a direction from the majority of the board. So well, I, I think this is a matter partly for the subcommittee to consider, but also I don't think the board is going to make any decisions tonight, certainly. No, I, I know think that. that the public hearing is closed. We're not going to take any more public testimony unless there's some things in writing uh, proposals. I think we want to entertain that, but mm -hmm. I think the next step is for the board to get down and start trying to. I agree. I, I'm just wondering if you're planning on doing that at your October yes. meeting. Yes. Okay. Andy? Uh, Ellen, uh, perhaps we should, Hal and I should get in touch with you and uh, schedule a subcommittee meeting soon within the next week and a half or so. Yeah, I would like that. I think that that's part of the responsibility of the subcommittee, and, and I think any board member that wants to uh, have input into that should also take that opportunity to talk to Andy or Hal about particular issues that, <coughs> concrete things that have come out of this hearing that would like to be addressed by the subcommittee and bring back something else uh, or bring back a proposal or changes or amendments or suggestions, alternatives, whatever. Yeah, if I could, Bill, I'd just like to reiterate to folks out in the community that um, Hal and I'd like to see your comments and proposals in regards to redrafting of the ordinance just as soon as possible. And you could deliver those to the health department, to Helen. Okay. Thank you. A copy of the ordinance as proposed? Do, do we have extra copies here? Yes, there are more copies up here, Cedric. Is there any other questions about the process here from any? Um, we do appreciate this. I think that there are many issues for us to address. I don't think we're going to. I would be surprised if we adopt any ordinance very easily, even in the next session. I think there may be several more sessions about in the within the board. And uh, if there is suggestions or proposals that you want us to consider, uh, we're going to be open to that. Uh, you know, the public hearing is closed, but uh, we're not. Uh, w this is not some secret deliberative body that's going to be uh, keeping. Uh, any other input from uh, out? Yeah, Kevin. So is this the September meeting? N no, we had our September meeting of the board, but we separately scheduled, as you remember, at the August meeting, uh, this for just the public hearing on this ordinance. Okay, so this will probably come up maybe in October. It will be on the agenda on October, whether I, I, it's unlikely, it seems to me, that we are going to adopt an ordinance at our next meeting. I think we may be looking at additional proposals. We will be having discussions among the board uh, as to a, f a draft, uh, but I doubt we, we will be, I mean, maybe I'm wrong on that, but it seems like this is a process that is en route, but is not near its final conclusion yet. Andy. Uh, Bill, I, I don't know if this is on anybody's mind out there, but uh, in the event that um, there are some substantive changes in the draft ordinance, uh, would we have another uh, public hearing? I don't think we're going to have another public hearing, but we're certainly going to be making public the proposals as they come forward before the board adopts them. But I think the public hearing, per se, is concluded with this. I don't think we have an obligation to hold multiple public hearings. Yes, Fern. Uh, and it, this is a recommendation to the City Council? No, it won't go to City Council before you take final action on it. But then they must take an action. That's right. And so must the Commission. That's right. And those will be public. Right. Mm -hmm. There will be, <laughs> this is only the first round of three sets of agencies that have to deal with this. We're just the first step, then it goes to city council, and then, or I don't know which, who it goes to first, but basically there will be several steps in this process. Uh, we are an agency of both bodies. We are given the responsibility for uh, protection of the public health and so this kind of ordinance comes from us but under state law in order to be enforced within the five mile city county area uh, it has to go be approved by both the city council and the county commission 
Yeah. Um, for people that aren't used to the regularly scheduled board meeting schedule, it's the third Thursday of every month unless it's announced otherwise, and so that would be October 15th. Yeah, and we, if there is any change in the meet, the normal meeting date, the that will be announced a week or more in advance. And generally, the agenda comes out <coughs> approximately a week in advance, and the agenda is public and can be gotten uh, by just contacting the health department. And if tobacco becomes an item on the agenda, I'm sure you'll have plenty of opportunity to know about that. Nothing is going to happen unannounced at any pub at any board meeting, that's for sure. No, particularly not on this topic, and, ge and generally not on any topic. <laughs> I, I would mention, too, that my interpretation of, of proper procedure would allow the board to make a decision on, on the ordinance anywhere between what's proposed in this current proposal and nothing at all. If we went for something that was even more draconian, that would have been outside what was heard in the public forum, and I would, as a member of the board, ask that we have have additional public input if we're trying to go outside of the, the bounds of what people commented on. If that makes sense. Is there any other questions, procedurally or otherwise? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, we'll take additional comments in writing, and particularly if there are concrete, as Andy calls it, redlining or uh, whatever that people feel uh, would be helpful, uh, we're interested in that. And I mean, we're interested in, this is a, in a process that is, we're a long way through it. We, this is the eighth or seventh draft of this document already. There have been a number of subcommittee public hearings with sort of public group committees, but we're not done, and this is not the end of the game, and we want to keep this open as much as possible so that we have the best, if we are going to adopt an ordinance, we have the one that we can live with to the maximum of consensus that we can. Yeah. The um, City Council and the Health Board would both have that option to enact it in the city limits. Right. That's not what staff's proposing because we, we would wish to capture more of the commercial zone and make it more of a level playing field, but they would by law have that option. I'm not sure exactly what process they'd have to go through to exercise that. Um, it's on. It would be upon the city council's authority. So if they don't approve it, the health board and the um, county commissioners, that becomes moot then at that point. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's an ordinance of the city that is given extra tor extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction based upon the county commissioner's acceptance of that. Well, um, if because we're in a formal hearing and you're accepting written comment, and I, of course, support and encourage that, I think we either need a closing date for this next round or you need to leave it open till it's the next open. time you meet. Kay. I think it's open till the next time we meet. I, I don't want to cut anybody off arbitrarily. Uh, there may be other comments or thoughts as people go. I mean, there may the next draft may entail some additional comments, too. I, I, I'm not going to cut this process off keep it as open as I can. Any other questions, comments? All right, thank you.